I'd like to welcome all of you to our last webinar of 2024. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Kishore Mohanty. I'm the interim director of CSEE. As you know, uh, the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment is a collection of uh, the work of 25 faculty, roughly. And we do research on all kinds of uh, <clears throat> subsurface applications. Uh, as you can see here, from uh, conventional oil and gas to shales to hydrates, geothermal and hydrogen lately. Uh, we have nine joint uh, industry programs. We also call it here industrial affiliates programs, which cover many topics from hydraulic fracturing to EOR to CCUS, uh, which is called carbon UT here. So many topics, uh, we have nine of them. Um, and we organize our uh, uh, webinars, one every month for the industry, and they are on the second Tuesday of uh, every month uh, at noon. If you miss the seminar, no problem. Uh, we put them in our website, as well as in our YouTube channel. Um, so in the next month, we have a seminar that will be given on January 9th. Please put that on your calendar uh, by Professor Matt Baloff. And during the seminar, if you have uh, a question, please post it uh, in the Q&A section. Don't wait till the end. Just post it uh, when the question comes to your mind. If you have any request for future seminar topics, you can also post that there and we'll, we'll consider it. Uh, let me introduce our webinar speaker today. Uh, he is Professor Hugh Dago. In fact, he's going to be the director of the center CSEE from this January. Uh, congrats, Hugh. Uh, he got his BS from Harvard and PhD from Rice University. He has worked for Slumberjay, uh, Bingham, and Chevron, and he works on porous media, geohazards, hydrates, and nanotechnology. Uh, he is going to speak to uh, to us about gas, hydrates, and submarine landslides. With that, you. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction, Kishore. And um, yeah, I'm happy to be sharing the news that I'll be leading CSEE starting in January. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you all about a field expedition that we had um, back in the spring and early summer um, of 2023, where we were looking at um, uh, gas and gas hydrates as a geohazard, and specifically their relationship with submarine landslides on the east coast of the US. Um, this was Excuse me. This was a large uh, collaborative effort funded by the National Science Foundation um, involving scientists from UT Austin, the US Geological Survey, Columbia University, um, La Rochelle University in France, and the uh, Weizmann Institute in Israel. So let me start out with a little bit of motivation for what we were looking at. Um, in 1929, there was a large earthquake, magnitude 7.2, um, and a uh, tsunami, a, a tidal wave that struck uh, the southwest, uh, or excuse me, the southeast coast of Newfoundland. It's called the Grand Banks earthquake. And um, this earthquake was felt as far away as New York, as um, we're looking at the Pharrell intensity here. There was shaking in Boston and New York. Um, the epicenter of the earthquake was out here in the Atlantic Ocean. But what happened was that there was a large uh, tsunami that hit the uh, the Burren Peninsula here, which is uh, kind of southwest of the uh, St. John's area, and uh, caused 28 fatalities and a significant amount of damage. You can see some houses were swept out to sea, others were knocked off their, their foundations. Um, and the uh, tsunami run-up was locally up to 13 meters, which is, you know, close to 40 feet. Um, and so this was you know, a very significant uh, disaster, particularly um, you know, for, for the people of Newfoundland. 
Um, and we can ask what caused the uh, the tsunami. And uh, there's actually a really interesting story uh, behind this. So um, right after the earthquake, there is a sequence where these uh, transatlantic cables, which you can see illustrated as these lines going across here, they were snapped one by one going from north to south. And the theory that Hazen and Ewing first put up in uh, 1952 was that there was a submarine landslide that moved down the slope here and cut those cables in sequential order. Now, subsequently, um, multi-beam seafloor bathymetry mapping has identified the submarine landslide that resulted from that earthquake. It's out here, um, right off the uh, continental shelf, south, south of Newfoundland. And um, uh, some tsunami source modeling has come up with um, you, you know, the uh, the wave run up that would result from this submarine landslide evacuating the slope and perturbing the um, ocean surface. And sure enough, right here on the Burren Peninsula, you can see some of these models predict up to two meters, which is kind of the average run up that they saw um, for this. So here's an example of an earthquake triggered uh, submarine landslide and associated tsunami causing significant property damage and loss of life on the U.S. East Coast. Now, we can think about the different continental margins in terms of two different settings. So there's what we call a passive margin, and then there's an active margin. Passive margins are characterized by not very steep topography. There's not a lot of tectonics going on. These are coastlines like the east coast of the US, the northwest coast of Africa, where there has been continental rifting, the ocean is, is widening, and we just have you know, sedimentation coming down, depositing sediments out into the ocean basin. basin. There's generally not much in the way of tectonics going on. Um, active margins, on the other hand, are where we have subduction zones with large earthquakes, volcanoes. So these are places like um, Japan, uh, Sumatra, uh, the west coast of South America. So these are areas where we expect to have a lot of tectonic activity. Um, and these are the areas, again, where we would expect to have a lot more tsunamis and submarine landslides um, and that sort of thing. Um, and indeed, um, earthquake triggered submarine landslides are very common on active margins because you have so many of these earthquakes. Um, here's an example from the um, 1964 uh, magnitude 9.2 Alaska earthquake. This is the largest recorded earthquake that has ever happened in the United States. Um, the epicenter was here uh, north of Prince William Sound. Um, and what we see are these uh, marks here, these triangles, these are submarine landslides that were triggered by that earthquake. And here's one particular example um, looking here in near the village of Ch uh, Chenega Cove, where there was several of these landslides that were uh, nucleated here in this um, fjord area that uh, came down here and followed the uh, topography and caused um, tsunamis that um, inundated Chenega Village and um, and caused a lot of damage and um, and loss of life. So these are common on active margins, as we would expect. However, we do see in the geologic record evidence of large, very large submarine landslides on passive margins. So here's a couple of images of those. Um, this is a classic paper by Lee looking at the distribution of submarine landslides on the east coast of the U.S. And you can see how large some of these are. They're, you know, several hundred kilometers long. There's the Currituck slide, the Cape Lookout slide, the Cape Fear slide. So these are very large events. We see them on the uh, northwest coast of Africa. The uh, Sahara slide is um, probably one of the better known, but there are several other ones in this area. And then the Storega slide offshore Norway is a very large one that's been very, um, you know, studied in, in great detail. So why do we care about large submarine landslides on passive margins? Well, they can affect coastal communities in exactly the same way that they affect coastal communities um, on active margins. And there's been some um, uh, paleontological um, research done on the effects of the Storega slide. So it happened about 8,200 years ago. Um, and there, you know, there's evidence that it caused significant disruption to some of the Mesolithic se um, settlements that were along the uh, east coast of Norway here and also in, um, in northeastern Scotland. 
Um, and so when you look at, you know, some of the um, tsunami runup heights, you know, the Shetland Islands, you're above 10 meters. Um, same thing in some areas on the, uh, the, the west coast of Norway. Um, so think about what if a similar event happened offshore, you know, the eastern U.S. today, and we had a 15 meter tsunami, you know, overrun the, um, you know, the outer banks of North Carolina or some of the large population centers on the east coast. That would have a significant effect on populations. Um, and when you look at the age distribution of these large submarine landslides on the east coast of the U.S., you can see that looking back in the geologic record as far back as 15,000 years, so this is going back to the last glacial maximum and the retreat of the glaciers during the last, the last ice age, you can see that there's a number of these events that appear to happen every few thousand years. Um, the last ones that we know to have happened were about 4,000 years ago. And so the question is, is there going to be another one? And when is it going to happen? And what can we do to assess the risk associated with to our coastal communities from these, these uh, natural hazards? So the motivation behind our research is what is causing these submarine landslides on these passive margins? And what are the risk factors? So um, is it an earthquake trigger like the Grand Banks um, tsunami? Uh, is it something related to isostatic rebound from uh, glacial uh, retreat or glacial advance? Is there something related to salt? Um, we'll see later on that um, there is active salt diapirism in the area that we investigated. Um, or is gas or dissociating gas hydrates somehow implicated here? Um, these are the reasons that people have put forward, and there's no real consensus on what is the main risk factor and what is the main trigger for these large submarine landslides. So we went out and we investigated a couple of these large ones. Um, the main uh, area of investigation was the Cape Fear submarine landslide, which is right here. It's about 260 miles long from its source region right here on the upper continental slope to its final runout distance here. Um, there's another one nearby called the Cape Lookout Slide, which is similar length, not quite as large in volume. Um, and they're located here offshore uh, North Carolina. So, you know, again, this is an area a lot of people live here. There's a lot of infrastructure and it's, um, you know, good to have some kind of a, a hazard assessment here. So what we did was we went out and we collected um, over 3,600 kilometers of high resolution 2D multi-channel seismic. Um, we collected 80 meters of piston cores at the uh, sites uh, indicated here. And um, we also did um, heat flow measurements at, at eight sites. And uh, we spent a total of 33 days at sea uh, doing this um, over the course of this field campaign. So we sailed on a vessel called the, um, the Marcus G. Langseth, which is operated by Columbia University. Um, we, it's a, a large um, you know, industry class uh, marine seismic vessel. Um, and we mobilized from Norfolk, Virginia um, on May 9th. And so here you can see uh, what the vessel looks like. She's um, fairly large, although that doesn't prevent her from getting tossed around in heavy seas, but um, you know, it's good for, um, uh, good for what we needed to do. So um, to acquire the data, we used a um, six kilometer streamer and the streamer, it's this yellow um, cable right here. It is a series of hydrophones which are used to listen to acoustic energy that's propagating through the water and it is towed off of the end of the boat. And so it's, it was long enough that the end of it was actually over the horizon. So we could not really see it the whole time we were towing it. But we knew it was out there because it had a buoy on the tail that we had radio communication. With. So, um, so we deployed this off of the, uh, the winches here that were on the vessel. And uh, we were able to um, record the seismic data. Now, the way that marine seismic works is that there are um, air guns which provide the source of acoustic energy in the water. And I'll show a slide in a minute. But basically, um, it creates a large bubble that's an acoustic energy uh, pulse that propagates down through the water and through the subsurface and then back up to the water where it's recorded um, by, the, um, by the hydrophones. And so um, I've got a, um, got a movie here of the... Um, uh, 
of the uh, air, one of the air gun arrays being deployed. There it is. It's got this float and the air guns hang down below it. And um, here's a, a photograph of both of our air gun arrays um, ready to go. OK, now the um, inside the vessel during the course of the expedition, we spent most of our time here in the data analysis lab. And it's this large room with um, what seems like an excessive number of computer monitors here. <laughs> but um, these all tell us a whole bunch of different stuff about what's going on um, over the course of the um, seismic expedition. Um, for those of you who have done seismic acquisition or uh, it's kind of similar to wireline acquisition, you have you're basically doing a bunch of quality control during the course of the of the job to make sure that all the tools are working properly and the data that you're getting are good. So we have monitors over here for you know bathymetry. So this is water depth. We're using sonar to look for gas seeps, um, you know, ship navigation to tell us where we're going, where the um, where the streamer is relative to the vessel. Here's all the monitors for data quality control. Um, we have you know, environmental temperature, speed of the ship, wave height, that sort of thing. Um, this person over here is what's called a protected species observer or a PSO. And um, anytime we're operating an acoustic source in the water, we want to be very careful to avoid any kind of marine wildlife that could be disturbed by it. So they're there always watching and listening for cetaceans, um, birds, turtles, that sort of thing. Um, and if there is, if we detect an animal in the vicinity, we have to shut down the operation. So they're always working while we're acquiring data. And uh, here's a bunch of people involved. Uh, this is my PhD student, Ali, um, who is on the cruise. Um, master student, Mason, over here. Um, we have a couple of guys from the US Geological Survey working on processing the data. Um, Tanner is a PhD student at Columbia University, and this is my desk right here. And then, of course, you have to have coffee when you're out at sea because otherwise uh, nothing works. So a lot of really impressive operation. Um, and what we did was um, we were acquiring seismic data. So the way the marine seismic works is you've got your um, air gun here, which is your acoustic energy source, and you propagate that energy down through the water and then down through the sediment. And anytime that there is a change in the acoustic properties of the sediment, some of that energy is reflected and some of it is transmitted. The energy that's reflected comes back up and goes through the water and it's collected um, or it's received by the, um, the hydrophones on your receivers here, and some of the energy keeps going down. So we take all of the arrivals at those um, hydrophones and we process it, and we come up with an uh, image of the subsurface that shows us um, you know, in distance versus, um, well, it's travel time, but you can convert that to depth. Um, where the different layers are and also the different properties of the layers and the subsurface. So it's a very valuable tool for looking at the subsurface without actually having to go down there and, and take samples. Okay, so now I want to give a little bit of background on, on gas hydrates because this is one of the things that we were looking at. So um, gas hydrates are solid crystalline ice-like compounds that are um, they're a, a cage of water molecules that are oriented around a low molecular weight gas, which is a, called a guest molecule that's inside this clathrate cage. Um, most natural hydrates are methane hydrates, where methane is the guest molecule. Um, they're non-stoichiometric, but they have a formula that's roughly equal to this, so one mole of methane per five and three quarters moles of water. And they're stable at low temperature and high pressure. And so this is typical of deep water continental margins within the first couple of hundred meters uh, below seafloor. Um, uh, the zone in which they're stable is called the gas hydrate stability zone. And we can illustrate that by looking at the phase envelope for um, methane hydrate. That's what this line is here in pressure temperature space. Now, what I've superimposed here, this is a typical temperature profile in ocean water where we've got temperature um, versus pressure. And pressure be, can, can be converted to depth by assuming um, hydrostatic pressure conditions. So you can see that um, within, uh, except within the first couple, you know, six or 700 meters of water, once you get into deep water, methane hydrate will be stable even within the water column. And this is a big problem for, you know, flow assurance in offshore settings. Um, but when we get into marine sediments, let's imagine we've got a seafloor roughly two kilometers water depth. 
Now, within the marine sediments, you'll start off at a seafloor temperature of two or three degrees Celsius, and the temperature increases along the geotherm. So here's a typical 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer geotherm. Um, eventually, that temperature profile will cross the phase boundary and exceed the uh, stability conditions for gas hydrate. And so as long as your geotherm is below the phase envelope, gas hydrate will be stable in those sediments. We call that the gas hydrate stability zone. Below the base of the stability zone, gas, methane gas is going to be stable. Now there's an interesting acoustic phenomenon that happens uh, right at the base of the hydrate stability zone. So um, the amount of energy that's reflected at an interface between two layers with different properties um, is a function of what's called the acoustic impedance. And that's simply the product of the density and the uh, P wave velocity in that layer. And you can further decompose this in terms of the uh, bulk modulus and the shear modulus. So um, when you've got acoustic energy propagating down through the sediment, um, anytime it encounters an interface like this, the fraction of energy that is reflected is given by this reflection coefficient, and it's a function of the acoustic impedance contrast um, between those two layers. Now, here's the thing about gas. Um, gas has a much lower density and a much lower P wave velocity than hydrate or even water for that matter. So what happens is that anytime you've got gas in your sediment, your acoustic impedance will be much lower than the case where you don't have gas. And so at the interface between hydrate bearing sediment and gas bearing sediment, you get a very strong negative reflection coefficient. And so you get a negative polarity reflection at that interface. And it's very easy to identify this in seismic data. And we call this um, the manifestation of this in seismic data. We call it the bottom simulating reflection. The reason that it's, it follows the same topography as the bottom is because it mainly depends on the temperature profile. So as long as the temperature gradient is the same, then it'll always occur at the same distance below the seafloor, relatively speaking. Um, a lot, it depends weakly on the water depth also. So when you go into shallower water, the interval will be thinner. But it, you know, locally, it, it follows the topography of the seafloor. And um, here's an example from an area that we looked at with our seismic survey. So here's the seafloor here. That's this reflection. And then what you see below that, you see another reflection that it comes and goes, but where it's present, it follows the topography of the seafloor, and that is the bottom simulating reflection. So what we've got here is we've got gas in these sandier layers that is trapped up against the phase boundary here, and the sediments up here are going to contain hydrates. So this is a really good indication that we've got gas with hydrates in the sediment um, above it. Okay, so now I'm going to get to some of our preliminary um, science results, and we're going to look in detail at the head scarp region of the Cape Fear slide, which is right here. These are all our seismic lines that go across it. That is the farthest up dip head scarp of the Cape Fear slide. Um, you'll notice this feature here. This is a salt diapir that uh, breaches the seafloor. It's called the Cape Fear diapir, and as we'll see, that might be important um, for the overall system dynamics here. Um, one thing you'll notice is that this kind of looks like a shark, um, so I'll just leave that up there. Um, but uh, there's something interesting, which is that within the head scarp region, there's actually several different discrete failures that have been identified. Um, and you know, there's up to five of them, and they occurred somewhere between 13 and 28,000 years ago, uh, based on our best estimates from radiocarbon dating. So this is the main action as far as where the, where the slides have nucleated. Okay, so we're going to step through some of these dip lines from north to south that cross the head scarp region. We're going to look at the uh, features that we see below the seafloor. Okay, so we'll start up here with line, um, line, that's line 24. Okay, so line 24, I want to point out some features here. So first of all, here's the seafloor. We go from the outer shelf down onto the upper continental slope where that topography changes. I want to draw your attention to this feature right here where we've got these uh, apparently prograding sediments that form these cloniforms. I'll talk more about those in a minute. Um, 
this uh, we're interpreting this as a Miocene age shelf edge delta. So there's going to be some sandier sediments in here with higher permeability, and then it's got some clays as well. So a pretty heterogeneous system. You can see a few of these um, growth faults um, as well that intersect um, some of the area. OK, now stepping next line to the south, what you'll notice is that below this cliniform package, we start to lose coherence in our seismic signal. OK, and this is we're interpreting this as evidence that there's gas in here. So anytime there's gas, you typically lose the reflectivity within that region. And the, those gassy sediments appear to truncate here up against a fault, which could be a ceiling, uh, a ceiling layer. As we move farther to the south, we see um, even more gas coming in in the deeper section, um, and we start to see a BSR become apparent right above that gassy package. This BSR is discontinuous, so it's not present there. There it is again, very strong, not present there, and then it comes back a little bit here. So um, we also start to see some evidence of apparent gas escape features that come close to the seafloor. Um, so there's the BSR, and then yeah, another possible gas escape feature there above where the BSR has been disrupted. Uh, moving even farther to the south, we see even more gas, even more disruption, and these some gas escape features. There's a really good one there. Um, this little uh, point there, that is one of the uh, head scarps for one of the Cape Fear slide failures. So again, it's right above this gassy area and right down dip from that gas escape feature. Um, one thing you'll notice is that these gas chimneys, they don't actually come to the present day seafloor. They come close to it, but not quite. And I think that's an important observation. Um, finally, going even farther south, the gas comes even more up dip. You can see there's um, that gas bearing layer has been eroded into right there. Um, the BSR comes and goes. The BSR is truncated right there. So something is cut it off, which is interesting. Um, and then this is our farthest south line again. Here's the BSR. BSR comes up here. The gas comes pretty far up dip. Um, so uh, yeah, again, there's the BSR and again, a potential gas escape feature right there. So to summarize our observations going from north to the, to the south here, um, we start with um, no BSR and no gas. And then as we move farther to the south, we get more gas, evidence of gas escape, particularly in the regions near and just up dip of the headscarp. Um, and then as we move away from that uh, head scarp again, uh, we lose some of the features that we that we've seen. And so what we think is going on here is we've got gas accumulation in this particular sedimentary feature. Now, what is this? So what we observe here is we've got um, these um, downlapping and um, beds down here that downlap onto this surface. And then as we move up from there, we have these prograding um, cliniforms that move uh, seaward um, that also truncate and there's some erosion into each other. And these features taken together are really good evidence of um, a shelf edge delta. So the way that these form is that when you've got your continental shelf and the continental slope, if you have a river that comes out here right to the shelf, it'll build a delta right across that shelf edge. And it has these particular features um, that are shown here in this block diagram where you've got these distributary channels and these turbidites far farther down slope, but you've got you know, these um, la locally layered sandy and shaly sediments. Uh, you can see these in outcrop. This is an example from um, Svalbard up um, in the Arctic Ocean where you've got these thick sands separated by these clays. And you know, at kind of the scale of the feature that we were looking at, you've got these prograding cliniforms that have you know this trunk out, uh, excuse me, pinched out and truncation um, on the lower slope. So that's very similar to what we observe in our um, in our seismic data. Now, if we look at a strike line going across here, just up dip of the headscarp. You can see um, the gas accumulation here that's been eroded into. You also see a lot of these gas escape features here um, coming out of that unit that's been eroded into. Okay. Um, as we move down dip, this is another um, strike line. This one goes across below the failed material. You can see the most recent Cape Fear slide in the seafloor. Um, 
But you can see the BSR comes in here. And again, this is an indication that we've got gassy sediments below hydrate bearing sediments. Um, to the north of the Cape Fear slide, that BSR disappears. And this can mean a couple of things. Um, it can mean that we've lost the gas below that. It can mean that we just don't have as much charge for the for the gas accumulation there. But um, there's something very interesting going on there with respect to the gas in the hydrate system right below the slide and on the flank of the slide. So our observations, without getting too much into the interpretation yet, are that um, we've got less gas in that clinoform package when it's closer to the seafloor. We have more gas escape features near the Cape Fear slide. The BSR is only present near the Cape Fear slide. And there's a notable uh, absence of gas beneath um, the Cape Fear slide uh, head scarp, um, which we see here. So somehow we think that gas has been removed. And what we think has gone on is that we have this process where we've got gas migration from some down dip source into the shelf edge delta. It comes through the permeable layers and accumulates up here on the up dip side. And then at some point, something causes that gas to leak to the seafloor. Um, could be a reduction in hydrostatic pressure as sea level drops during the last glacial maximum. Uh, could be an earthquake. Uh, we don't really know. Um, but then we get that leakage and it causes slope failure. And so you remove the gas, you cause slope failure. And then you can imagine this process repeating over and over again, which might give us that range of the different failures that we see at the head scarp. So this is our working hypothesis. Um, now, obviously, this requires a um, source of gas. And so um, we need to think about that as well. So, you know, I'm thinking about this in the petroleum systems framework where you've got source, migrate, you know, well, yeah, source, migration, pathway, reservoir, and seal. And so I think we've identified the reservoir and the seal, and even maybe the um, migration pathways pretty well, but where's the gas coming from? So what I want to point, your, point out here is farther down dip. So we have some uh, seismic line that crosses the Cape Fear diapir right here. And what you can see, so here's the diapir here. It's a salt diapir that breaches the seafloor and it has a very deep root. It goes down you know, con to a considerable depth. Um, but one thing you'll notice is that there is another salt diapir here to the southwest that does not come to the seafloor. But there are some important points in this line that I want to show to you. So one of them is the salt, obviously. So there's our salt diapirs. Um, when we look above the crest of this diapir, we see some evidence of gas migration through some conduits. These could either be fractures or they could be um, you know, faults or some kind of somehow sheared um, sediment, but the gas is coming up here and it's accumulating in these um, sands here that pinch out on the BSR. So um, what we observe is that somehow the salt is related in generating the migration pathways that can charge some of these gas charged sands. Now, as of yet, we don't really have the, you know, the, the key evidence that ties these, this gas, these gas migration pathways to the gas accumulation up here, but we're hoping through some combination of more detailed analysis and um, you know, some interpretation guided by machine learning that we should be able to identify uh, potentially where that gas is coming from. So that's pretty exciting. And I think this might be key to what we're seeing. Um, just in case you're wondering, there is actually another diapir over here called the um, Blake Ridge diapir. And when we went over that with the boat, we did see some gas seepage. So, you know, the gas that comes out here could somehow get up dip and come out, um, you know, at the seafloor. Although that's going to be a challenge just based on the orientation of these sands. So anyway, identifying the migration pathways is still a bit of a challenge, but something we're working on. OK, so just a little more on the conclusion of the cruise. So we were out there over Memorial Day and the crew with, of the ship were um, kind enough to give us a cookout on on the deck. So we had um, hamburgers and cookies and cheeseburgers and all kinds of good stuff. And we were able to sit out in the sun and it was a beautiful day. Um, we had a cornhole tournament. I lost, but that's OK. Um, so the next thing we did was we had a port call in Moorhead City, North Carolina, which is right up there next to Beaufort. 
And um, we had kind of an exciting time because uh, when we sailed back out to come out and do our cores out here, we had to cross the Gulf Stream. So this is a plot of ocean current around the time that we were working in the area. And um, the Gulf Stream was already very active at that point. You can see that we had this core of, you know, three to four knot current uh, coming across here. And so um, the particular day we had to sail back out to our study area, um, a cold front had just come through. So we had wind coming from the northeast opposing the flow of water. And that's a pretty common occurrence out there. And it causes these very large waves when you're crossing the Gulf Stream. And so um, let's see. Yeah, this is a video that I took um, of some of these waves and um, you can see that, um, you know, some of them are about, you know, 20 foot hot tall. So we had a very rough ride um, out back to our field site. But once we got out there, um, the waves subsided and we were able to start taking some cores. So we did, um, uh, we took uh, jumbo piston cores, which use this large uh, 10 meter long core liner. We also have these outriggers here, which have um, thermistors in them, which we use to measure the uh, thermal gradient. And um, inside the core barrel, we had just a PVC pipe, which was our core liner, and that collected the core. Um, so here's one of those pipes ready to be deployed. Um, we deployed the core over um, over the um, rail using the um, the A-frame here. So here you can see it going into the water. It's got this um, you know very heavy weight on top of it, which helps push it into the sediments. Um, it's heavy enough actually that just under gravity, that 10 meters of core barrel can push all itself all the way in. The sediments are very soft. Um, and so we did 24 hour operations for the last week of the cruise. Here's us um, working over the rail at night. That's always a fun, a fun experience. Um, and we got some really good cores that we're in the process of processing right now. We're measuring permeability, compressibility, and a bunch of other physical properties. Um, and uh, results will be forthcoming. And I'm pretty excited about some of the things we've been finding. Um, at the end of the cruise, um, I needed a haircut. I was tired. Um, we disembarked at um, Cape Canaveral, Florida. There's the the vessel docked right there. Um, as we came into port, we passed near the uh, NASA uh, 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 Kennedy Space Center. So here's a picture that I took. And um, actually, the um, the port here at Cape Canaveral, this is the port where the Disney Cruise Lines um, sail out of. But also, um, SpaceX uses this for their um, operations in the Atlantic. And so Unfortunately, the battery in my phone died as we came into port, but we passed by some of the autonomous barges and some, you know, half of the, um, you know, the Falcon 9 rocket bodies um, were sitting on the barges. So it was really cool. Um, anyway, a lot of really interesting infrastructure there. But um, that was the end of our cruise, and it was a lot of fun. It was a really good experience, and we got a lot of great data that we're working through right now. Um, I'm actually speaking to you today from San Francisco, where I'm at the American Geophysical Union fall meeting, where we are presenting some of our preliminary results to um, 35,000 other <laughs> geoscientists. So it's very exciting. Um, so I'd like to give a big thanks to the crew of the Langseth and the participants in both the seismic and the coring legs that we see here. Um, there's a really great team. We got a lot of great work done. And I want to give a special shout out to the um, UT uh, students we had along. Um, there's myself. This is um, Carlos Figueroa Diaz. He's a UT PGE undergrad. And then Mason Farnsworth and Ali Muhammad, who are grad students um, working with me. Um, so um, also big thanks to the National Science Foundation for um, providing the support um, for this project, which is uh, which is ongoing. So um, with that, I'm going to wrap it up and um, see if uh, anybody has any uh, questions. OK, well, um, while we're waiting for any questions to come in, I've got a couple of um, softballs that I can that I can answer for you. So the first one is, you know, a lot of you are wondering, OK, this is the CSEE webinar. What does this have to do? What's the energy angle on this or what's the environment angle? And um, you know, I think that's a, that's a good first one. So what's the energy context of this work? Um, and I think that that's a really good question. So first of all, this very squarely falls under the environment um, part of the CSEE name. But if you think about this more broadly, 
Um, the east coast of the U.S. is an area where right now we have a lot of ongoing interest in um, offshore wind operations. In fact, I um, was just talking to a colleague here at the meeting uh, who's involved in geohazard assessments for offshore wind operations. And, um, you know, it's a big deal getting getting hazard assessments for, the, for any kind of offshore infrastructure is really important. And, um, you know, the large submarine landslide hazards on the US, US East Coast, um, there's a lot of work being done to understand those right now. And so I think this can be a big part of that. Um, it also links, you know, gas hydrates are a big part of, you know, some of our research right now, both on the energy side and on the environmental side. And I think it links up um, very well uh, with that. So that's kind of how this fits into the broader CSEE context. This question is, how can this be generalized um, to areas where there is a lot of oil and gas development, um, like the Gulf of Mexico? Now, th that's a really interesting question. So if you think about what I said at the end there with how um, the salt in the subsurface is a big player in opening the migration pathways, I think that's really key to understanding how some of this might work in the Gulf of Mexico. So we know that above a lot of these salt structures, the salt diapirs and that sort of thing, the sediments are under tension, there's a lot of fractures, and these do you know, make very good gas migration pathways. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, you know, the salt is a lot more mobile. Well, there's just a lot more of it um, than there is um, on the U.S. East Coast. And if you think about, you know, the salt being this dynamic system, um, you know, I think there's it plays a big role in the geohazards that we see in the shallow subsurface in the Gulf of Mexico. And, um, you know, again, thinking about all of the, you know, seafloor energy infrastructure that we have, um, you know, I think the, the gas and the hydrate system and how it interacts with, um, you know, remote triggers uh, like, like earthquakes and submarine landslides, I think that's a really interesting thing to look at um, for us in the energy space. And, and again, to be able to characterize what the hazard is and what the mechanisms are behind it, um, I think is really a um, is is really a big deal um, in terms of you know our you know service to the industry and also to um, to society. Um, very cool, Hugh. Thank you. I think it is cool. Um, does the contact between the gas hydrate and free gas become a plane of weakness? that the slide takes advantage of. You know, so that is an open question, whether or not it's that interface or if it's just a weak sedimentary layer that happens to be near that interface that causes the, um, that, that, that is the, the plane of failure. Um, I tend to think that it's the latter. So I think what happens is you've got these weak layers that cross. So if you imagine, I don't know if you all can see me, I think you can. If you imagine here's the base of hydrate stability, here's a weak layer that kind of comes across that. When that gets right there at, at the base of stability and the gas gets destabilized, um, because the base of hydrate stability crosses a lot of different layers that have varying mechanical properties, um, I think it's harder to imagine that failing than having slip on a weak sedimentary layer. And so I think that the uh, the dissociation right there, the interface of the weak layer and the base of stability is the trigger, but then you're failing along these weak layers. Um, at least that's my that's my understanding of it, although you know it could I could be wrong. It's uh, a lot of it depends on the mechanical um, you know the contrast and mechanical properties between, uh, the different sedimentary layers relative to that um, phase boundary. Yeah, um, you know, I think that this has been, um, you know, these type of field expeditions are a really great opportunity for students to get involved with. And I've been really happy that we've been able to get, you know, so many um, students on these expeditions because we're really training the next, uh, you know, the, geos the next generation of geoscientists. Yeah, all I have to say on that. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank you all for uh, for coming. And if you're watching this um, on the recording, thanks for coming to the recording. And, and feel free to reach out to me if you have any uh, questions or comments.